okay, at zero hour four five minutes, that test point should be Delta one zero two zero one five Charlie. You do not need an F four, and you need to start at Hotel dot four, which is on page nom twenty eight, with a new test point. Copy, and I have the information for the one at one hour, 23 minutes. Great. We got a big crowd watching up here. And we got a big crowd down here watching the big crowd up there. Go ahead. The two pieces don't come together quite flush. Uh, I got Roger over here to help me out, and we worked at it a little bit together. But to pull it apart, the base connector has some rub marks on it, so it's a real tight fit. And I, I mean, it's just like a you know a paper thin gap. It's just not quite perfectly flush. It's as it's as far down as we can get it. Is it okay to just leave it like that and see how it goes? Or do you want us to work this a little harder? Yeah, CHT says that gap is expected. But, uh, thanks for noticing. Okay, thanks. Thomas working on an experiment called the bubble uh, BD bubble drop and nonlinear dynamics. And what we're looking at here are levitating a drop in an acoustic wave and then exciting that with another sound wave and watching the decay of the vibrations as we go along. You can see the bubble on the I mean the drop on the T V screen there. And uh, you can see it vibrating a little bit. The vibrations are being induced by uh, sonic waves or sound waves, and there's a computer over to Don's right there panning around now to see. And on that computer, you can see uh, what will look like sinusoidal waves or waves that are regular oscillations. And uh, this is Don recording the data and, and uh, helping the PGSC to record that data for the PI when we return. We have a large number of combustion experiments on board. This is one of our experiments at studying how soot is formed. This is a ethylene flame burning. You can see the, the flame in the top of the monitor in the center there. Franklin Terrace was so interested in watching this stuff, he came back from getting ready to go to bed, and he's hanging in there helping me. He 
he's upside down because that's actually the orientation of the flame. The flame burns from the top of the monitor down, so he gets a better view of it that way. And he and I are consulting on the shape of the flame. We do have some adjustments on board that can let us real time adjust how that flame burns. Okay, I guess I'll talk about this one. Uh, this is Greg Lenteris, uh, CS2, demonstrating how you wash your hair in space. And uh, what he had there in his hand is what we call uh, rinse-free shampoo. It actually works very well. Everybody has different style. Greg likes to uh, heat up water in the galley, as you see him holding the water there. And he puts uh, the water, combines that with the rinse-free shampoo. And uh, on Earth, the water would run down your face and it'd be a real mess. But in space, because there's no gravity, it just kind of hangs there in your hair. You see him using the towel there to towel it off. Uh, these towels are uh, sort of lint-free towels, so they're not all that great at absorbing the water. And over to Roger. And as uh, astronauts know, but other people may not know so much, they do a lot for family support while the crew's up here on orbit. This is an example of me talking on the shuttle amateur radio experiment to my mother this morning. I got to wish her a uh, happy Fourth of July and uh, family reunion today. She's going to, so that was a real opportunity for me to have a contact with the family back home while from up here. Okay, this is me uh, recording some data on the Astro PGBA experiment, and this is basically a small greenhouse that we fly in space to grow plants. And uh, there's a couple reasons scientists are interested in that. One is that in understanding plant growth without gravity, they can better understand the physiology of plants that could help improve uh, plant production on Earth. Uh, the other reason is that eventually, as we do longer missions in space, we're going to have to grow plants and take our food with us. Uh, the other neat thing about this experiment is it involves the uh, express rack, which is a modular rack system that we'll use to change out experiments on space station. And this is our chance to prototype that and figure out how well it works before we uh, fly it on space station. Actually, uh, Susan and Don took that experiment from the mid-deck and transferred it back to the space lab in this rack. If you were to accidentally cut yourself in microgravity with your blood clot like it does here on Earth, and you may be aware, Wes, that we do study the immune system up here. There's some data that shows the immune system works a little bit differently in space, but the clotting system, as far as we know, works exactly the same way. And certainly, when we get minor cuts, as I actually, in fact, currently have on this finger right now, yeah, they clot up just fine and normally. The one thing that is a little different in space that I've noticed over my four flights is that you don't have your hands in and out of water all the time. So sometimes the cuts don't heal quite as fast because it's harder to keep them clean. You don't realize how much cleaning you get by accident on the ground that you don't get up here in space. Okay, I guess I'll do the next question. Uh, just as an added that this is the first time that we've taken internet questions on the computer, so I'm looking across the uh, cockpit at the uh, at the computer screen, and this one is from Jim Roach uh, from Cary, North Carolina, and he asks, being in a controlled environment for a prolonged period of time and breathing a prescribed percentage of inhaled oxygen, do you periodically run blood gases on the crew to determine if they are maintaining prop proper oxygen saturation levels? And the answer to that is that we don't do that routinely. Uh, however, on my first mission, there was some concern from data from the Russians that our hemoglobin oxygen saturation decreased uh, following spacewalks. And we did a spacewalk, and we carried this special instrument that we used as soon as we came back in the spacecraft. And uh, we determined that we basically had 96 to 98 percent uh, hemoglobin oxygen saturation. And so that answered that question. The next question that Roger's going to answer is from Zachary S. in Kissimmee, Florida. The question is, two questions, how does it feel to be in zero G, and do you have a fireproof room to do these experiments? Well, I think the answer to the first question about how does it feel to be in zero G depends on what day you ask me that question. The first day, it's a little bit different than being down on the ground, but the more days you're up here, the greater it is. And at its worst, it's absolutely fantastic. It's almost like being in a swimming pool with no friction. You're on one side, you push off, and you glide completely to the other end of the pool. And that was always a desire and a race we used to have when I was a child to see how far we could glide. And up here, you could glide on forever almost, it seems. The second question is, do we have a fireproof room for the fire experiments? 
And the answer is, it's not really a room. It's a small chamber. It's about a, uh, eight inches on the side or something in that dimension, about an eight-inch uh, cylinder. And it's uh, surrounded by another layer of steel so that there's no danger of an explosion at worst. And so it's absolutely safe. And the fires are really small in any case, so there's not any real danger to these things at all. And Roger, if you could, it, we are getting some reflection, and it's going to be hard. But if you could point to where you see the liquid. Copy that, and we see that. 